continue our journey through the book of Luke. And um, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us here. Thank you for your spirit, Lord, that continues to teach us, to guide us, to instruct us in righteousness. As we look at the passages, help us see your sovereign hand that continues to guide us and lead us as we walk with Christ. And Lord, I pray that we will embrace it, that we'll hold on to it, and that we'll be assured that you are with us no matter what. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, listen, guys, Theophilus was a wealthy VIP in the first century who became a Christian. So there's this guy, he's Greek, he, he um, apparently has a, a high um, you know, profile job, and um, he becomes a Christian. And he started attending the church, and this is shortly after Jesus had resurrected from the dead and the church began. And, and so he starts attending church and was excited about his spiritual experience. He was excited about Jesus and salvation and regeneration and adoption uh, into God's kingdom. He was excited about the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and excited about eternal life. But like what always happens when we come to faith and believe in Jesus, the enemy starts shooting doubts and questions about the existence of God, the validity of Jesus, and the authority of the Bible. Look at your neighbor and say, I know how that is. Because that's exactly what happens. So Theophilus started to have doubts. He started to doubt his faith and that his faith was based on a lie. So Theophilus commissioned Luke, our author. It, Luke was his private physician. And Theophilus commissioned him to investigate the life and story of Jesus. Who, who you know, was he who he really claimed to be? The Messiah and Savior. I mean, Luke wasn't a believer in Jesus when he started this investigation. You know, Matthew, uh, in his gospel, he tries to convince the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Mark's gospel tries to convince the Greeks that Jesus was the Messiah. But Luke's not trying to convince anyone of anything. Luke is just investigating the story, getting to the bottom of it, finding, here it is, here's what he's finding, everybody say it, the truth, that's it, that's what Luke is looking for. So without any bias or preconceived ideas, Luke hit the road to find the truth. He found Jesus' hometown. He found Jesus' old neighborhood, his brothers and his sisters. He found Jesus' mom, Mary. Luke did. And so Luke interviewed Mary. And she told him her part in this incredible story. And we'll pick it up from where we left off last week as Luke is listening, as he's interviewing Mary and listening to her story. Joseph and Mary got to Bethlehem late. That's what Mary told him. We got to Bethlehem late. And there was no room at the inn, not even in the parking lot. So we kept walking. And outside the city limits, Joseph pointed out a vacant stable. Probably pointed it out and said, what do you think? You know, what about there? Mary probably looked at it and said, well, I don't like spiders and snakes. <laughs> But honey, do whatever it takes to make do. Because the, this baby's coming soon. So she told Joseph, that'll have to do. It's, it's, it'll be enough. And so sometime during that night, Jesus was born. God covered in human flesh. And guys, it's ironic and fitting that Jesus was born in the sheep fields. Because Jesus is the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. So it's both ironic and fitting. And so Jesus is born, God clothed in human flesh. But as the couple inspected the newborn, they might have scratched their heads a little bit. I mean, Jesus wasn't born with milky white skin and blonde hair and blue eyes. He didn't have a cool British accent or a halo. You know what I'm saying? He didn't look like a Messiah. In fact, he looked like every other Jesus or Joshua they knew. 
He looked ordinary. Everybody said, what? Ordinary. But before they could, before doubt could get a hold of them, God sent them, everybody say it, a what? A confirmation. Confirmation is the word for today. Everybody say it again. Confirmation. Confirmation means verification. It means proof. You know, when doubt pokes his head up or skepticism surfaces, God sends confirmation. God's guiding hand that leads us from glory to glory and faith to faith in our walk with Jesus. That's confirmation. God's guiding hand. The first confirmation happened when the angels invited the shepherds to come to see and to celebrate the birth of the Savior. The shepherds, guys, are invited right up to the manger to see and to worship the Savior. Pretty awesome. Everybody said, what? Pretty awesome. Pretty awesome considering that shepherds weren't allowed into the courts of the temple. They were considered unclean. They could only worship in the court, in the outer court behind the big wall. Shepherds couldn't come up close to where the temple was. They had to worship from afar off because of their position, because of their, their, their job, because of what they dealt with. And so the angels are inviting them to come right up to the manger. It just goes to show that Jesus came to remove the barrier that keeps us far away. Here's a verse. Here's how Paul described it in Ephesians chapter 2. Read it with me. For Christ himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. That ought to make you cheer right there. Hey, because listen, we weren't shepherds. Some of my, you guys, none of us were probably shepherds, but our sin made us unclean and separated us far, far away from God. But because of the blood of Jesus, we have been made nigh or close. He has gotten rid of the wall that separates us. Yeah, that ought to make you cheer even a little more, but, but that's the whole idea. I mean, here's a, a couple who, you know, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and she became pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now they have the Messiah and they're a little bit, you know, well, you know, is, he, what, is this what he's supposed to look like? Is this what he's supposed to be? Is, you know, is, is this supposed, and they're having a little bit of doubt, confusion, but God gives the confirmation by sending shepherds and shepherds come. I mean, and they keep coming and all night long long and they're there to worship the king. Everybody say, what a confirmation. Wow. Now, after the huge Christmas drama that played out there, Mary told Luke that she and Joseph laid low in Bethlehem for a few days. They were exhausted from the trip, from the pregnancy, the labor, and they were exhausted from the waves of shepherds that came all night long. So they laid low in Bethlehem for a few days. Then after eight days, they took the baby to the synagogue there in Bethlehem to be circumcised. That's where we are. Let's read the story. And here's what it says. Verse 20. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, as it was told them. And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And we'll stop there. Children are a gift from God. They are on loan to us. And God prescribed in the Old Testament that parents raise their children, everybody say it, raise them how? In the Lord. Say it again. In the Lord. That was God's prescription. They're on loan to us, and we need to raise them in the Lord. Parents are responsible and accountable to God for their children's physical and spiritual welfare. You see, for Jews, circumcision isn't a medical or hygienic choice. It's a spiritual choice. 
Circumcision was a sign of covenant with God. It was a sign of a special relationship. Parents were to start their parenting with this in mind. We must bring our children up in a special relationship with God. Not just a one-time event, but an all-the-time responsibility. Your spiritual work isn't done just because you dedicate your children. Let your neighbor and say he's talking about you right now. Just look at him and tell him. Here's the verses, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's read it. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commandments that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tell them to your children again and again. Make sure they know it. Here's the next verse, Proverbs 22, 6. You're familiar with it. Read it with me. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. There it is. So they brought Jesus there to be circumcised. A reminder to them that bringing up their child in the Lord is what God prescribed. To bring him up in a special relationship with God. Now at the circumcision, the child would also be officially named. They'd give him a birth certificate. They'd write it out. He was officially named. You know, some people love their name. Some people hate their name and want to change it. Oh, I just don't like my name. I don't know why they named me that. You know, some, some of us have picked up a few names along the way, right? Don't you hate nicknames? Everybody said, what? Don't you hate nicknames? Names that tell on us. They highlight a feature, a characteristic, an attribute, or a fault. Nicknames. Say it again. Nicknames. Names like Chango, and Worm, and Bones, and Elvis, Estompe, Cadra. Huh? And those are just from my wife's family, by the way. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> nicknames might highlight something about us, but they don't define us. Do you understand that? Jesus had a few nicknames. They're scattered throughout the Bible. The seed of Abraham, the root of David, counselor, everlasting father, wonderful, prince of peace, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, king of kings, lord of lords, son of man, friend of sinners. He had a lot of nicknames. But those names highlight a character and an attribute. There's only one name that defines him. Everybody, what is that name? Jesus. That means God saves. Say it again. Jesus. That means what? God saves. God gave his son the name Jesus because it defines him perfectly. And at his name... Demons tremble, sickness bows, prayers are answered, sin shudders, and sinners are rescued. Isn't that awesome, guys? In fact, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, let's read it out loud. Here's what it says. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. I love it. Let's say his name again. Wow. It identifies him completely. God saves. The name Jesus is attached to the one person with unlimited power, uncompromising love, and inexhaustible forgiveness. The synagogue pastor had dedicated many a Jesus. I mean, there was probably one on every cul-de-sac. But this one was different. This one was the real thing. 
nudge your neighbor and say the real thing. Now, five weeks later, Joseph and Mary are in Jerusalem for cleansing and Jesus' redemption ceremony. So here's what has happened thus far. Jesus has been born. He laid low for a few days. They take Jesus to the synagogue. He's circumcised and he is um, given his name officially. A name that will forever be available for anyone who needs help because the one who owns the name is able to save and to help and to heal and to rescue. Amen? But five weeks later, Joseph and Mary are in Jerusalem for the cleansing and Jesus' redemption ceremony. You see, every firstborn Jewish male belonged to the Lord and had to be redeemed at the temple. A lamb for a son. It was a sacrifice. That was the redemption price. In fact, let's read it. Chapter 2, verse 22. Now in the days of her, Mary, purification according to the law of Moses were completed. They brought him, Jesus, to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. We'll stop there. Now Luke is Greek. He doesn't know a great deal about all the ritual, all the ceremony. But he did do the research and he gave us a couple of Old Testament quotes. There is footnotes. One of them was that the redemption ceremony is biblical. According, it's in the Bible and part of the history of the Jewish people and he writes it there. The second thing he lists is that because Joseph and Mary were poor, they offered two turtle doves or two pigeons instead of a lamb. It's because they were poor. And so he's just verifying that, but he doesn't give us a whole lot of information about the ceremony or the ritual or what it's about. He spends a lot more time on this next thing. You see, Jesus is now a month and a half old. Everybody said, how old, how old now? A month and a half. And Joseph and Mary might be struggling with doubt and fear again. Especially the responsibility of raising the Messiah. Think about it. How would you feel? The responsibility, the weight. What if, what if he gets sick or colicky? What if he has an accident? What if his circumcision doesn't heal? And by the way, are Messiah supposed to have diaper rash? You know what I'm saying? There, there's a big weight. You know what they're saying is, God, you know that this is our first rodeo. You know this is our first kid. We have no experience. We have no skills. We have no resources. Are you sure that we are the right people for the job? That's what they're asking. Because they even, they're saying, because we brought him to the temple, to the holiest guys in the world, the official priests, and they didn't recognize us or him, the Messiah. Are you sure? How many of you ever struggled with doubt, insecurity, huh? Even something that it seems so black and white, you're like, oh, I don't know, it's, it's, there's all kinds of shades of gray. You know what I'm saying? So I, 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 we all struggle, and so they're struggling with it. So because of their fear, before fear and insecurity takes control, God sends another confirmation. Everybody said, oh, another what? Let's read it. Verse 25. Here's what it says. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up, Simeon took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a right to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there is one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel, the tri of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple. You know, Luke really did a background check on this gal. But she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. So when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And we'll stop there. So as maybe... Mary and Joseph are feeling the pressures, the weight of the responsibility of the Messiah and, and feeling a little insecure about them. Listen, God doesn't want our faith to be achy, shaky, or flaky. Look at your neighbor and tell him that. Tell him that. They don't want your faith to be achy, shaky, or flaky, man. God will, do what it, will use whatever method or means to encourage, to fortify, and to establish our faith. He will use whatever necessary to quiet our doubts and dispel our fears. He will do whatever it takes to prepare us for what is ahead. To anchor us. Everybody said to do what? Anchor us. He will do whatever it takes to guide us along from glory to glory, from faith to faith in our walk with Jesus. That's who he is. And that's what he does here. Simeon walks up in the temple, I mean, right place, right time, because he was led by the power of the Holy Spirit. Right time, right place, Jesus and Mary have just gone through the purification and offering the sacrifice, and they're leaving and wondering, are we the right people? Because, I mean, nobody knows, and I mean, even the shepherds knew, you know, but the, 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 here at the temple, the holiest guys, the priests, they didn't know nothing. Are we the right people? Is this the right are we going in the right direction? And all of a sudden, Simeon steps up, tats the baby in his hands, asks them, I'm sure, may I? And then he lifts him up and confirmed Jesus as the Messiah. He declared, Simeon declared that the salvation that Jesus would bring will go beyond the Jews and to the Gentiles. And that is a place for you to cheer, because if you're not Jewish, hey, thank God, right? And he says that. He lifts up the baby and says, this baby is going to bring salvation, and not just to the house of Israel. He's not going to be just a light to the people in Israel. He is going to be the salvation for even the Gentiles. And I love it. Then he looked. Simeon looked at Mary and said, Be prepared for the rejection. Your son will not be received well, is what Simeon was saying. Your son won't have very many Facebook friends. His website won't be trending. People will be combative and hateful and unbelieving and rejecting. Your son will be as welcomed as a skunk at a lawn party. That's what he's telling him. Or as welcomed as India cuisine at a Mexican potluck. Mm. Simeon tells her, watching the haters hurt your son will hurt you. It will be a knife to your soul. Now God used a couple of elderly saints to reinforce Joseph and Mary's faith. God ordered the steps of these faithful, righteous, and spirit-led people. Ordered their steps to cross Mary and Joseph's path 
to be at the right place at the right time. Oh, how we need more of those people to encourage and to inspire and to stimulate and to confirm our faith. We need more people like that, don't we? But let's not twist our necks looking for them. Let's work at being them. One pastor in scripture urged his congregation on this. Let's read the verse. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Read it with me. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. I love it. Let's not just be looking for those people. I need somebody to help me now. And thank God for it because God will send them. But let's also plan on being those people who are able to encourage and stimulate faith. So if your faith has been a little achy, flaky, or shaky lately, almost like a rap song, if it's been a little achy, shaky, or flaky, consider all the confirmations and assurances that God has been sending you. Consider them. Here's one. How about the entire Bible? That is a big assurance and confirmation. I mean, think about it. 66 books, 40 different authors with a united message that says, God loves you, He died for you, He will rescue you, and He will never leave you nor forsake you. How about that, huh? God's Word, the Bible, gives us insight and illumination and direction and guidance and wisdom. What about that assurance and confirmation that God has placed in front of you? How about the Holy Spirit? That's the inward witness that you are His. Paul said it, it's the, the Holy Spirit cries from within our heart, Abba, Father. Inside there is a gravitational pull towards God. The Holy Spirit that convicts us. You know, the one that knocks on your door and tells you, hey, don't do that. Stay away from there. Don't go to that place. Hey, you know, that's not the right thing to do. You should do this. You should act this way. The Holy Spirit. Can you say amen? The inward witness that convicts, that teaches, that instructs, that reminds us. Remember what the scripture says. Remember that you're supposed to love. Remember that you're supposed to you know, act in faith and trust the Lord. He, the Holy Spirit on the inside, that's a big assurance and confirmation. Isn't it? Wow. Or how about... This gray-haired man right here in front of you. This old guy. What about me? Who, like Simeon, has spent most of his life living under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And God ordered my steps to be at this place, at this time, to encourage, to reinforce, and establish your faith. Really, honestly. And listen, and the countless others, not just myself, but the countless others of faithful men and women here who share and encourage and inspire through their words and through their actions. What a big confirmation and assurance to your faith. Woo! You see, God will never let you get lost. God will never let you go on without His guiding hand. Here's the last verse of the day. Let's read it. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Read it with me. We are now members of God's own family. 
Now we live in the hope of eternal life because Christ rose again from the dead. And God has reserved for his children the precious gift of eternal life. It is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change or decay. Out loud, everyone together this next part. And God in his mighty power will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you are trusting in him. Isn't that awesome news? I don't know the way. Yes, he does. And he will make sure to give you all the assurances and confirmations that you are that you need in order to get you there safely and perfect. Can you say amen? I love that. So listen. If you're navigating through an unwanted divorce, a financial crisis, a sickness, or some kind of uh, health condition, if you're navigating through, uh, you know, grief, or you're navigating through uh, guilt of, uh, of, of past sins and abortion, or, or whatever it is that you might be dealing with, I want you to know that He will never leave you nor forsake you. You don't have to be confused. You don't have to be insecure. You don't have to wonder if He still loves you. If, you know, he will guide you all the way to the end. And this is the hope that we have, just like He did for this young couple who had no clue on how to do what they were doing. To walk with Jesus, He will do the same for you and for me. Isn't that awesome, guys? Let's all stand because it's the truth. Let's stand. If you're here this morning and haven't given your heart and life to Christ, you're still wrestling, you're still carrying the load of guilt, of insecurities, of anxieties. All of that can be swept away and you can have assurance, peace, tranquility in the middle of all of those storms. Because Jesus Christ is, as the angels declared, peace. He'll bring it. And all you have to do is trust your life with Him. So if you're here this morning and you haven't done that, and you're saying, today's the day for me, I want to do that, would you raise your hand and say, that's me. Maybe you just need to rededicate your life and you haven't given, you haven't surrendered totally. You've been kind of in and out, wishy-washy. You found that your faith has been flaky and fleeting. Here's a way to anchor it. To say, that's me. Wonderful. So let's pray. Out loud together, Father, I know I'm a sinner. And I need your forgiveness. I've ignored you. I've run from you. I've even fought you. But today, I surrender. I repent for my sin. And I turn to you. Wash me in your blood. Draw me close. Because I'm yours. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer or rededicated your life this morning, there'll be some leaders standing up here in a moment. They'd love to welcome you to God's family, give you a Bible, some materials to help you understand that. Don't be embarrassed. Just come on up after the last song. They'll welcome you to God's family. This is the greatest day of your entire life and eternity right now. So take advantage of that. They will also be here for those of you who just might need some counsel, some prayers, some encouragement. Hey, these are those people we're talking about, the Simeons and the Annas. These are those guys. And they have a wonderful way of being able to share and encourage you right where you're at to give you confirmation and assurance that you're at the right place and you just you can keep trucking with Jesus because, hey, God's got His sovereign hand over your life. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make His face to smile on you and be gracious to you this week and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you and may He establish all the works of your hands. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend, guys. We'll see you on Wednesday night.